and welcome you to this meeting of the Community Bible Baptist Church. If you would stand with me, take your hymnal, we'll turn to hymn number 502. Hymn number 502, and can it be that I should gain? Hymn number 502. Ready? And can it be that I should gain an interest in the same? I'm, I'm already racing on the first first song already. Here we go. Hymn number 539. Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? Ready? Who can cheer the heart like Jesus? We're not on the same uh, same words there with the uh, with the screen there. Hymn number 539. All that thrills my soul is Jesus. Very good. All right. Now that we're all on the same page, here we go. Ready? Who can share the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine? True and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine. All oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. of 10,000 in my blessed Lord I see love of Christ so freely given grace of God beyond degree mercy higher than the heaven deeper than the deepest sea soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of 
ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. What a wonderful redemption, never can a mortal know. How my sin, though red like crimson, can be whiter than the snow. Father, we do love you, and we thank you for your goodness to us and your mercy, your grace. Lord, you've been better to us than we deserve. Lord, if we never got another blessing on this side, heaven is more than we deserve. But Lord, you've been so good to us along the journey, and you are the fairest among all. And Lord, if we would turn our eyes upon you and stay fully focused on you, not be distracted, not be detoured, not be discouraged by the things of this world, God, we would live a much happier, much more joy-filled life because, Lord, you truly could meet all of our needs if we would let you. It's when we become dissatisfied with you and hunger for the world that we miss the blessing that you have. May, Lord, tonight we just be encouraged. May we be strengthened. We have a very special service. We have some special guests. And, Lord, uh, it's hard sometimes to be aware of everything going on around us and so you send people our way to inform us to remind us to strengthen us that we might pray and act as believers in an unbelieving world and so lord i pray tonight that you bless this service thank you for regina thank you for brother malpas and lord those that are here guests with us tonight may they be encouraged and of course may you strengthen our family we pray in christ's name amen you may be seated
the sooner that we fill out, uh, figure out that we live for and serve an audience of one, uh, the sooner we'll be happy in life. Uh, you try to please everybody, you'll please no one, including God. Uh, but when we begin just to pursue and seek after Him and Him alone, the rest of it falls into place. We're glad you're here tonight, and uh, thank you for visiting with us. Thank you for being our guest. Uh, my dear friend Regina Brown is here. I'm going to introduce her in a few moments. Brother Malpas, somewhere in the building. I don't know. Way in the back. Good Baptist in the back. Amen. And uh, Missionary Aviation in Alaska. We've been supporting their ministry for a good while now, many years. And uh, I'm going to finish the sermon that I started last Sunday night. Uh, started one and didn't finish it this morning. We're starting a trend here. Amen. But uh, going to finish last Sunday night's sermon. And uh, so we have a lot to do, short time to do it in. Uh, let me run through the rest of that song right there that popped in my mind. Uh, I'm eastbound and down. All right, here we go. But uh, if you're a visitor, your first time or first time in a long time, do we have anybody visiting like guests? Looks like most everybody's home, folks, tonight. Some visitors. Uh, we have uh, Brother Bud and Miss Ellen has a sister and brother-in-law here. God bless you, folks. Thank, thank you for coming, being down visiting. Other than that, let's do that. Let's, let's let the choir come down. You stand. By the way, we had 80 folks today for our new members' luncheon. 84 had one of the best new members luncheon we've had a long time. We rejoice that you stand. Choir's going to come down. We're going to get right into the service tonight with Miss Regina. God bless you. We're glad you're here. We make our way back to our seats. We'll begin the first verse of the Comforter has come. We'll start on the verse of the Comforter has come. It's on the on the screen. Ready? Oh, spread the tidings round wherever man is found, wherever human hearts and human woes abound. Let every Christian tongue proclaim the joyful sound. The Comforter. tidings round wherever man is found the comforter has come the long long night has passed the morning breaks at last and hush the dreadful wail and fury of the blast as o'er the golden hills the day advances fast the comforter Tidings round. 
every captive soul a full deliverance brings and through the vacant cells the song of triumph rings the comforter beside. I like that one line, though I, a child of hell. Say amen right there if you're on your way to a devil's hell and you met the sweet Lord Jesus as the Holy Spirit of our God convicted you, drew you to the Lord, and converted you, then sealed you into that day of redemption. And I like good songs with good message. I like that, that uh, Psalms chorus that's for the, the choir sang, uh, that our heart, the pant, like, Lord, I love the good singing, appreciate the music. And I look forward to tonight for a long time. Regina Brown, uh, when I was in Texas, the Lord allowed us to have tremendous uh, activity and influence in our local conservative uh, Republican uh, and just conservative in general uh, groups. And I had great opportunity to speak. I spoke at a lot of rallies and was very close friends with Congressman Ted Poe, who's just a tremendous congressman there out of the area. And when I moved to Florida, I thought, man, I'm going to come to this big old city and I'm going to lose those connections that I had to help me to influence uh, in, in the political realm. And, and not only did the Lord not let me lose those connections, he's grown those connections. And I got to meet uh, when I first came and, and just after our 9-11 our Honor Heroes program, when I was invited to become the chaplain of the Pinellas Patriots, one of the local groups. And, from that, with uh, Chris and some Christian A and others, the Lord just kept opening doors and opening doors. And I don't even remember where we ran into each other first. But since then, I've become a dear friend and thank the Lord for uh, Regina. She called this year and said, could you guys help us? And many of you volunteered. You met her there. And uh, Regina is the national director uh, for Family, Faith, and Freedom for the Prayer Network. She's the Tampa Bay director for the whole area. And we were talking about, can our church be involved in influencing our area? Now listen, we know the main thing of Community Bible Baptist Church is the gospel message. The death, the burial, the resurrection of Christ. To be a witness to those who are lost, those that don't know Christ. But listen, also as citizens, we need to be involved in the process around us. And so we were talking and she said, well, I'd like to come and, and just share some things about how people can get involved and she keeps me up to date on everything going on in Tallahassee, things that are affecting our, our voting and things local level and so on and so forth. Regina, you come, and we're just honored. Thank the Lord for you, and she's going to come and present a little bit about what's going on, and then we're going to both invite you to an event Tuesday night. Regina? Thank you very much, Pastor, and thank you all for having me. It is an honor to be here, and I see some familiar faces. We did work together during the uh, November campaign, and I, I'm very proud of your pastor because he'll, he'll do something, he does something that a lot of pastors don't, and that's speak out and get involved. And when we call to have a phone bank, you know, I know that th this is a, a real church. This is a church of Christians because they kept their word. I, I get a lot, of, I make a lot of phone calls and people say, I'll be there, or come on, we'll have so many people. But they, they said, we'll have about 20, 25 people here. 
And I'm, I have to, you have to forgive me. I said, oh, yeah, sure. I'm sorry. <laughs> and you know what? I showed up, and you all had exactly what you said you were going to have. So that, that, you know, I know that the word is preached here, and it's getting into soil, and it's um, being grown and watered and taking root, which reminds us of that. You know, your pastor, when he prayed, he hit on something I want to talk about tonight. Uh, not, not a long time. You know, when, when I say that, that, I mean, I could go on, but we're going to do that Tuesday night. But he talked about discouragement. And he said, when we look at the things of the world, we get discouraged. And you know what? I, I cannot talk to 10 people when eight of them are telling me it's hopeless. You know, it's, it's just, there's just no point. There's nothing we can do. I'm discouraged. Do you all see that where you go? You know, people are saying, we don't want to do anything. You know, it's just, they're just giving up. There is no hope. And you know what? Um, a few years ago, hope was the magic word. Everybody was excited. Something good was going to happen. You know, the hope was alive. And now people think there is no hope. You know, this, isn't the, this is not a new phenomenon. There was, uh, in the Bible, we are gi given instance after instance in the Bible, where people were discouraged and where they felt like it, it was hopeless. You know what Proverbs 13, 12 tells us? Hope deferred makes the heart sick. And I think that's what our culture is suffering now. Hope deferred. They thought they were going to have answers. And now they, 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 they don't have answers. You know why they don't have answers? Because we used to look to God in our country for answers. You know, then we began looking to man for answers, and may I say it, now we look to the government for answers. So uh, our hope deferred has made our culture sick. And one thing I learned from working in the campaign this season, and those of you who worked with us and made the phone calls, our culture is divided. You know, why, people say, why did we win, or why didn't we win, or who won here or there? Why, why did these issues not take precedent? Because our culture is divided. And I'm not talking about the culture. I'm not divided, talking about being divided between the church and the world. I'm talking about the people sitting in the pews, the people not sitting in the pews. The culture is divided. We're almost 50-50. We are losing ground on the word of God. And we're losing ground on the word of God because we are not pushing forward. And we are not being a aggressive in the word. And I'm not talking about aggressive be beating up people or anything like that. I'm talking about preaching the word and being aggressive. So, um, so we're dealing with a, a situation of hopelessness. But you know what? We're not the first ones. You know, we're not the first culture that did that. What about Solomon? What did he do? He filled himself up with stuff. You know, everything, he tried everything, just like our culture is now. He tried everything, and what did he say? Meaningless, meaningless. Everything is meaningless. There is no hope. That's while he was on his struggle, until he finally found out at the end where hope really was. And also, the um, when discouragement comes from looking at our culture, from, looking, from listening to outside sources. You know, um, when they went back, when in Ezra it tells us of the people who went back to rebuild the temple. They'd been gone from Jerusalem. They'd been taken captive. They'd been sent back to go and do the Lord's work and to keep working. And what did the culture say to them? They, it says in Ezra 4.4, 4, then the people around them, that's their culture outside of them, set out to discourage the people of Judah and make them afraid to go on building. I think that's what the world is trying to do to us, trying to discourage us and to keep, on build, to keep us from building. Well, we, this discouragement has got to stop. We are the people of hope. Our world is broken. Our people are, are fractured. They don't know what to do. And we are the people that have healing for them. We are the ones that can take the message to them. And, and instead of, and we want to sit and complain and look at the problem, and when we look at the problem, we get even more discouraged. You know, look, I, I have a pastor friend who says you can't be the good news and the bad news at the same time. And I think what we, we try to do, you know, we look and we complain and we murmur, and then we go out and try to tell people to come and join us. Okay, we do not have a sick political system. We have a sick 
church system. You know, we don't have, our, our, our political system isn't sick, our culture is sick. And until we bring people back to the word, until we transform that culture, until we move that needle and people start believing in the word of God, we're not going to make any difference. We're going to keep losing ground and losing ground. So we're going to do something different in Florida. Uh, I know, how many of you are all sick of politics? How many of y'all sick of getting that stuff in the mail asking you for more money? You know, people still believe that politics is going to be the answer to it. You know, politics is not the answer to our problem. God is the answer to our problem. Until we fit, the, we have a spiritual problem that we're trying to fix with the secular means. We have got to fix it through spiritual means. So we have what we're calling a big vision. Can you say big vision? Big vision. It is so big that I even had a pastor that it has a, such a big vision himself tell me I was being unrealistic. I slapped him, told him, don't ever tell me that again. <laughs> because we have got to transform the culture. So what we are going to do is we are going to start with prayer evangelism. You know, where does everything, where is reality? Reality's in the heavenlies. This is not real. Heaven is real. We're going to start with prayer evangelism, and we're going to prepare that soil. We prepare the soil of our culture through prayer. And when we, we're going to walk our neighborhoods, we're going to meet our people. You, know, you might feel like a political campaign to politicals, but to prayer warriors, it'll feel like a prayer campaign because that's what it is. And when that soil is prepared, we're going to drop the good seed of the word in there. And we're going to talk to people about the culture. We're going to teach the church the difference between the world and the, the Bible. We're going to help people move to a biblical worldview. So we're going to prayer evangelize. We're going to drop good seed of uh, truth into that soil. What happens when you put good seed into good soil? It grows. There's a change. Life happens. It, it springs up. You, you see the green of, of life all around you. And that's what our big vision is, transforming our culture through um, prayer evangelism, biblical truth, and then political action. We've been going at it with political action. We'll have people come into church and, and say, you know, you need to get involved. And all the political junkies like Pastor and I go, oh, yeah, we'll get involved. And everybody else goes, never mind, we don't want to. Because we've been trying to fix a spiritual problem with a secular way, through a political way. So I'm going to ask you again to come out tomorrow night. You will not believe how we're going to explode this county with prayer and biblical truth and then political action rather than political action and hoping everybody follows us. We'll be here tomorrow night, 7 o'clock. You won't want to miss it. We're um, a, a vision so big that even if we fall short, we're still going to change the culture. Is it Tuesday? It's Tuesday. We wanted to make sure of that. It's Tuesday night. Now, she gave you the, she was in my office about two hours because Regina can talk. But anyway, uh, <laughs> the thing about Regina is with all the discouragement, by the way, we got our first win in a long time last week when this gun control measure was voted. It's the first win we've had in quite a long time. But the one thing about Regina, she's an ultimate optimist because her faith is in the Lord. Here's the thing that will shock some of you. Her statistic, now, we're an independent, fundamental Baptist church, all right? So I would pray that our worldview and our thought process is much more grounded with a biblical worldview than just general statistics. Regina's statistics will blow you away. That the majority of, and we use the broad term evangelicals, when you ask them, she has a little survey, she asks them a specific question. The majority of evangelicals do not have a biblical worldview. That's why abortion, that's why homosexual marriage, that's why all these things. You say, well, how can evangelicals vote contrary to the word of God? Because they don't believe the word of God. They have a world worldview. Now her whole process, and again, we're not, we're not missing the line here. We know what our mission is. But the, the thought process is actually to explain how to teach non-biblical people 
the biblical truth. That's the only way they're going to get help is to get the word of God. And so it's just for us, I told her for us, it's a door to try to be a witness and to try to open the door. And if we can do it with this channel, we're going to do it. But it shocked me, the numbers, and I'm sure she'll maybe share some that Tuesday, the, uh, the number of evangelicals that have a world, world view versus looking at things through the lens of Romans chapter 1, uh, through the lens of the Word of God and seeing, well, God's for it. God's against it. And so we're excited about that. We love Regina. And if you don't have her uh, email or her information, if there's a question about something that's being voted on in Pinellas County or in the State House, uh, she, she keeps a good pulse on all that. And so you'll spend some time, maybe meet her tonight and be here Tuesday night and I look forward to it. Brother Malpas, make your way up here. Brother Malpas is one of our missionaries. Uh, I did not know this, but uh, we have a couple of young men that are interested in, in missionary aviation. And uh, Brother Malpas is home on furlough, and his wife, maybe give an update on your wife's situation there. But uh, if you look at their picture and just hold your thumb right there, it's a good-looking prayer. Anyway, that's what he told me to do. Brother Malpas, you come on. God bless you. Well, hello, everybody. It's, uh, it's good to see you today. The, um, my name's Earl Malpas, missionary to Alaska. And you folks have been supporting us, uh, I guess, well, since we were on deputation back uh, 13 or 14 years ago. There, you guys have gone through some uh, struggles o over the years. And, I, you know, I got thinking about how m me and my family, there's been hard times. There's been financially tight times. And, and Lord, God's been faithful and, and carrying us through. But we're not the only ones. There's churches like, uh, like uh, Community Bible Baptist that they've gone through some skinny times and some... Uh, all kinds of problems, and yet you folks have been faithful. It, I can't tell you how uh, exciting it is for me to be able to come back and encouraging for me to come. At, the, the church has grown significantly since we were here 12 or 13 years ago. Uh, strengthened. Uh, you I appreciate the singing. I realize. I hope you realize, um, or it's encouraging for me coming back after 13 years to see the church is actually growing, and you haven't reached into the septic tank to pull out the music. Uh, I appreciate that. I really do. I find as I come back, that's not always the case. My wife Lynn is normally with me, um, but she's. If you've been been able to follow our prayer letters, about five years ago, she had a seizure. Uh, based on some medicines interfering with each other, and it was a pretty pretty violent one, and it's caused a lot of problems with back and different things. And uh, we were on furlough, but we kind of rushed back to Alaska too fast, and she wasn't able to get well. So it's been a rough four years, and we're down here this time, and we're getting her some good help. She's a uh, uh, Lord's blessing, and I, I'm, I attribute it to the faithful prayers of uh, folks that have supported us along the way. My son Jeremiah, he's 19 years old. Uh, we lost him when we were here last time. He, somebody, uh, somehow or another, they were ushering him and they put him on the bus and they were going to take him, deliver him to somebody. Well, you talk about a panic. <laughs> we're, we're, we're from a little small community. We come to the big city and uh, uh, the, uh, present our work and somebody takes our kid and puts him on the bus to ship him off somewhere else. But yeah, we found him and uh, he thought it was an adventure. So, uh, but he, and he survived. But he, he's going to be going to a Bible college in um, uh, Fargo, North Dakota. It's a church uh, Bible college at St. Master's uh, Baptist College in this fall. And uh, so we appreciate the prayers of you folks for our family as well. So what do we do? I'm a missionary pilot and mechanic, um, preacher, different things. We, and uh, we, we've been up in Alaska, like I said, 12 years. I'm going to try to get about eight years of update in, in just about three or four more minutes. But we've, um, we have a ministry where I drive to have church. On a normal Sunday morning, I would get up around 4.30 in the morning, leave the house around 5.30. I live in a town called North Pole outside of Fairbanks, Alaska. I go through Fairbanks, top off, uh, and then start heading north uh, on the road. And I drive up and around. Uh, it's about 80 miles, air miles straight across, but we're driving, and um, it takes about four hours to get there. Uh, I, if it's colder and 20 below zero a lot of times I won't go but um, the coldest I've ever been I've ever gone to church I've just let you guys down here in, in uh, Florida understand so you don't whine anymore uh, the coldest I ever, I've ever driven to church was uh, someone asked and I said it was 58 degrees below zero minus 58 below zero 
and I wasn't the only one there. <laughs> now we didn't. I, granted, I did not shut my car off or the, or the van off. We kept it running, and, and uh, uh, the, the, the service was a little abbreviated. But um, when I drive, I drive across the country. We've had, we have been turned back by uh, snow drifts and things like that. But we also used the, uh, in that church there, when I started it about six years ago or took it over, I should say, uh, there, there was about two to four people showing up every Sunday in a village of about 55 people in the wintertime. It swells to around 90 in the summertime. Uh, well, over the four years, God, by his mercy and his grace, and he's just a loving God, we've been teaching, doing our best just to share truth. Truth attracts. When it's uh, presented in a, in a palatable way, a way that's not caustic, and uh, God's blessed, and we're having around 20 to 30 people come to church uh, every every Sunday uh, there in that village of 55. Uh, a year ago, Easter, God really blessed and just opened up the windows of heaven, and we had around 55 people show up. Uh, now, there's more people inside the church than there was outside the church. God's blessed. We've seen souls saved. We got. Uh, uh, the youth are the, coming and going to Bible camps, getting saved. We've had baptisms. Uh, have a, we have a bapti our baptismal is the hot springs, manly hot springs, and inside it's a, a little uh, plastic house and grapes are growing and beautiful flowers. Looks like Garden of Eden. Every time I baptize somebody, I want to get baptized all over. We also have uh, what we call Operation Saturation. We, uh, last uh, about five years, we've been trying to get one copy of the whole Bible into every house in every, every village above the Arctic Circle. Let me say that again. We're trying to get one complete Bible, King James Bible, in every house, in every village, north of the Arctic Circle. No big deal, right? Well, imagine the, just the land above the Arctic Circle is four times the size of South Carolina. Take South Carolina four times. Now, from heaven, you take God's um, pepper shaker and you sprinkle about 36 to 40 specks on four times the size of South Carolina. Those are villages, 40 villages. Each one of those villages has a soul, has souls in it that God sent his son to share the good news, the death, the, the death burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we've, we've gone up there and we've got one, it's taken us a number of years, but we've gotten a whole Bible, the best of our ability and the best of our knowledge. We've got one Bible in every house, in every village north of the Arctic Circle. And anybody been, well, that's to God be the glory. Uh, anybody ever been to um, St. Lawrence Island, Savunga? That's about, have you been to Savunga? Okay, Are you closer to uh, Gamble as well. How about the first man I've seen that? So, let me tell you where he's been. He's been 30, about 35 miles from Siberia. He's about 500 miles from Fairbanks. And that, which is, and it was about 5,000 miles from the uh, town, a little mountain holler that a friend of mine, Kevin Smith, has been in or was raised in. God calls up somebody. That's, I don't, that's the uttermost parts of the world. God's told us in Acts 1 8 that you're to be witnesses in Jerusalem. That's right here in St. Pete, Judea, Samaria, uh, to, and then ultimately, ultimately to the uttermost parts of the world. There's no way you guys can. Uh, do that except through missions and by your praying and by your support the Malpas family uh, as an extension of the, the, your ministry has been able to plant a Bible and give the gospel in villages all over the state of Alaska so from the from I could start going through and listen all the missionaries we, we fly and I help about 14 ministries across the state and from uh, Kevin Smith family from the Compton's family the Sereno family I could go on and on and on 14 ministries from them and from the Malpas family, I want to thank you for your faithful support. We've been trying to do our best to work hard for you. Now, we, we use innovative means. We get to use a, the Gospel of John and Romans. We put a, a dog mushing photo on it. And then we go to the Iditarod. Uh, if you've ever seen the start of the Iditarod in the last eight years, Earl Malpas is tucked up in there right up amongst the crowd. I got a big suitcase full of uh, John and Romans, and I'm handing them out to everybody that will take them. I've given them to the uh, champions of the uh, Iditarod, and a lot of the mushers have, fo have followed along, given the gospel out. God's promise that his word will not return unto him void. So we're doing our best just to get the word of God out and let him do uh, what he can do the best. Uh, so, And we couldn't do that without the faithful prayers and support of God's people that are down here in lower 48 holding us up in prayer, and, and giving the financial support. So thank for the Malpas family to your family. Thank you, and may God bless you.
Well, I want to see you after service. Thank you. All right, take your Bible, please, and turn to the book of Nehemiah. Brother Malpas, my wife, was uh, watching television one night, and we have gotten hooked on Yukon men, those fellows that live up in that village there. And so uh, just, just find it amazing that people would choose to live up there. And, and the way they just survival is an everyday uh, just to get through the day. And uh, the reason that uh, Brother Isaac knows where your village is there, he was stationed in the Coast Guard, and he thanks God every day for, Pan- for St. Petersburg, Florida. Amen. But uh, they, they know all about that cold weather. Well, uh, let's see. Last week, we, uh, was, it last, was it last week we preached on Ezra? Is that correct? Preached a lot this week. I was out of town, and I'm confused about uh, where I stopped off here. But we preached on Ezra and uh, building the temple first. Building the temple first. And we said when, when the uh, walls and the city of Jerusalem, and that's a message I, Lord willing, I'll preach next uh, Sunday night, I'm not sure, but I think I may preach that next Sunday night uh, in this home and family series. But in Second Chronicles 36, the last king of Judah comes on the scene, and uh, he is a wicked king, and God finally says enough. And we have the destruction of Jerusalem. We have uh, the captivity. And uh, now the 70 years pass, and God, remember, had said that there was going to be the uh, land was going to keep her Sabbaths, and uh, you're going to do right whether or not you choose to do right, or eventually God brings you to that place, but God's always going to get his way. And so the land had her Sabbaths, and God touched uh, Ezra, uh, and uh, we know that uh, he went back in. And remember the question that we asked was, if you're going to go back in and start, where would you start? And And logically, you'd build the defenses first, and then you'd build uh, the uh, houses and the temple. But God said, no, I want you to build the temple first. Build the temple first. Now, just reminding you of what we talked about last week. In our our message, and for the sake of the, the, the idea we want to bring out tonight, the temple is going to be the heart relationship with Jesus Christ. The temple, your altar, your heart relationship with Jesus Christ. Now, it is in the year uh, 536 that Ezra goes back. It takes them 17 years to build the temple. 17 years to build the temple. And finally, we find in uh, Ezra, we find the dedication. That's when the Old men wept and the young men rejoiced, but there was now temple worship again in the land that had been desolate for the 70 years. The story continues throughout the book of Ezra, and we find that uh, after Ezra, of course Zerubbabel then Ezra, after Ezra and the temple is built, there is another period of 10 years where the city remained the same. Now, the temple is built, but we come to the book of Nehemiah in chapter number 1. In verse number 1, we'll read a few verses here together. Ten years have gone by, 11 years, and we find that Zerubbabel has gone in, Ezra has gone in, the temple is built, but the city has remained the same. That means the walls are still down, there are no gates, and just a few homes have been built, but other than that, the city is, is left unprotected with the temple being built. So I want to read Nehemiah. We've read Ezra last week. Let's read Nehemiah. Next week we'll read 2 Chronicles 36 and put all this maybe together. The words of Nehemiah, the son of Hakaliah, and it came to pass in the month Shizlu, the 20th year as I was in Shushan the palace, that Hananiah, one of my brethren, came, he and certain men of Judah. And I asked them concerning the Jews that had escaped, which were left of the captivity, and concerning Jerusalem. And they said unto me, The remnant that are left of the captivity there in the province are in great affliction and reproach. The wall of Jerusalem also is broken down, and the gates thereof are burned with fire. 
And it came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Let thine ear now be attentive, thine eyes open, that thou mayest hear the prayer of thy servant, which I pray before thee now, day and night, for the children of Israel, thy servants, and confess the sins of the children of Israel, which we have sinned against thee, both I and my father's house of sin. We have dealt very corruptly against thee, and have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgment, which thou commandest thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech thee the word that thou commandest thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I will scatter you abroad among the nations. But if ye turn unto me and keep uh, if you turn unto me and keep my commandments and do them, though there were of you cast out under the uttermost part of the heaven, yet will I gather them from thence, will bring them unto the place that I have chosen to set my name there. Now these are thy servants and thy people whom thou hast redeemed. By thy great power and by thy hand, O Lord, I beseech thee, let now thine ear be attentive to the prayer of thy servant, to the prayer of thy servants who desire to fear thy name and prosper, I pray thee, thy servant this day, and grant him mercy in the sight of this man, for I was the king's cupbearer. Now we will not read uh, chapter 2 or following, but we will tell the story that he goes in before the king Artaxerxes. And Artaxerxes says to Nehemiah, why are you discouraged? Why are you down? And Nehemiah says, I can't lie to you, king. How can I rejoice when my people and my land are in such desolate shape? We find in chapter 2 that Artaxerxes gives command and gives uh, authority to Nehemiah. Nehemiah goes back to Jerusalem. He surveys the ruined walls. He encourages the people to build And in chapter 3, we find the building of the walls and the setting of the gates. Uh, Setting of the gates, building of the wall. The Bible says it took 52 days to repair the walls and build the gates. Now, it took 17 years to rebuild the temple. And it took 52 days to rebuild the walls. And what I want you to think about tonight and just kind of to, to think about is maybe a dad or a mom, maybe a, a young person trying to please the Lord, uh, which of the two things is the most important? And you would say, well, Brother Sansel, it certainly must be the temple. The temple must be the most important thing. First of all, that's our heart relationship to God. Uh, In the story, in our reading of the scripture, it took 17 years to build. And usually something that takes longer to build is worth more than something that took just 52 days. So, Brother Stan, so I'm going to vote that the temple is by far the most important of the two things. Whether it be the walls and the gates or the temple, Brother Stan, so I'm going to choose the temple. And then some of you would look at that and you'd say, well, Brother Stansel kind of made it look like that's the obvious choice, and I know he's a sneaky little sucker. So I'm going to vote that it's the walls just because I want to not be on the same side. Brother Stansel seems to be on. And and you also are logical. Maybe you have an engineering mind, and, and you would say, well, if you don't have any walls to defend from the enemy, that whatever you have in the temple is going to be vulnerable. So the walls are the outer defenses. Therefore, they're more important because they would keep the enemy farther away from what is important. So Brother Sam, so I'm going to vote uh, for the walls. And so some of you may vote for the walls and some of you may vote for the temple. And you say, no, the temple is first. That's foremost. We've got to have the temple, our heart condition, our walk with God. And uh, over here you say, no, Brother Sansel, uh, it's the walls. Uh, we're anti-temple people. And uh, the temple people become anti-wall people. And we split the church and we all go start the second community Bible Baptist church. And that's happened before. Well, I, I would like to maybe suggest a third option that I didn't tell you about in the beginning. I would suggest that they're both 
equally important. Because see here, if you do not have any altar, there's absolutely no need for any walls. And if you have an altar and you really love and protect and care for your altar, you certainly need to protect with some walls. Now here's the allegory, if you'll allow me to make an illusion. Here's something that happened. How many of you, now, now don't get, I want to say, I'm so, let me take this. I'm, I'm a little stressed tonight and I'm overweight as it is, so I'm afraid if this button comes off, it'll kill somebody in the front row. If, um, how, if, oh God, praise the Lord. I just had a revival. All right. If I make this statement, you'll, you'll forgive me and you won't get, uh, don't let the hackles on your neck get, jump up because I want you to stay with me through the whole sermon. How many of you, don't take a picture of this now, Regina. <laughs> the fundamentalists in our camp will send me over the edge. How many of you were raised in a, uh, a liberal, no church, no God, no nothing kind of world? Let, let me see your hand. I mean, no, Brother Malpass, no God, no church, no nothing. Keep, would you keep them up? I'm, we're not taking notes. I just want to know where we're at. No God, no church, whatever, your mom, dad, whatever. I mean, now I'm not talking. Now, listen, put your hand down. Let's, let's, you know, my wife tells me something. I don't ask clear questions. I'm not talking about just no church, but a moral mom and dad. I'm talking, you didn't have any kind of home training at all. You basically, whatever you want to do, you did it. I mean, I'm talking zero zero or at least very limited home training rules anybody like that oh that there's still some oh wow okay I was shocked I, I thought you know even though you may not have gone to church you'd have some you know basically at 12 13 14 you were doing what you wanted okay now so that's that one more time just so I get my mind around it okay James I know your testimony absolutely okay I did not know that brother carpenter amen I did not know that. all right how many of you were like me? Okay, um, let's see what side of the table I want. Let's go over here. This is the first side. So this is Brother Carpenter's side. This is the no, no nothing, Brother Dory, Brother Carpenter. They're living large and in charge at 12. Now, how many of you are like me? And you were raised. Now, again, clarity of thought. This is nothing. This is a little. This is us. I mean, I, we're out the door, but I can't go that far. Fundamental, super, I mean, you put the fun in fundamental, conservative, rules, rule, you had some rules for the rules, and you had a rules committee checking the rules committee. Let me see your hand. More, let's say more, more. Raised under a lot of rules. Okay. Just so that we don't leave you out somewhere in the middle. Okay. All right. Okay. This is the group. I'm going to, please forgive me. I'm, I'm, a little, I'm a little bit confused. I'm just trying to fix this. <clears throat> We're going to move the walls over here. This is the fundamental world rules. We're going to move the temple over here to where basically... Basically, there's no rules. But the temple's here. It's important to the illusion. What's important? Temp temple's over here. Wall's over here. Right? Okay. If you do not have any walk with God, there's nothing on your temple, in your on your altar, in your temple, then I would waste a lot of our time trying to teach you about building walls because you don't have anything on your temple. Uh, if, however, you have tremendous walls, tremendous walls, but you don't have anything on your altar, you're a Pharisee. Because... Because your whited sepulchers, Jesus, Jesus, by the way, Jesus said that. 
your, your, your beautiful walls, but you have nothing to protect. You're empty. Now, here's, here's what's happened in our world. So give me a minute. I'm gonna t- I think I'll be able to tie it all together in a minute. Here's what's happened. We have, uh, let's start with us. The movement that I was raised in, the church that I grew up in, it, when my sister, let me tell you the story. When I was, uh, when I was a little, now I don't remember this, so my sister, my, I have to trust my sister and my, my dad and my mom. When my sister was 14 years old, we attended the Forest Hills Baptist, we, we, we always attended the Forest Hills Baptist Church, Decatur, Georgia. But when my sister was 14, and this is going to be in the uh, early 70s, the early 70s, my father came in from the office where he was a staff member at the Forest Hills Baptist Church and said to my sister Deanna, Deanna, you will no longer ever, ever put on a pair of britches as long as you live in this house. Ever. Britches. Pants. Britches. <laughs> Give me all your blue jeans. And uh, what happened was, we had been at the Forest Hills Baptist Church in Decatur, Georgia, and uh, we had been uh, just an old camp meeting, just enjoyed, enjoyed Jesus, but no rules whatsoever. And Dr. Hudson began to really uh, grow and become influenced, and he got around some men, and, and he adopted uh, just a very, very, very uh, strong position on pants and movies and dancing funny one of the ladies today asked me about dancing i said you can dance all you want to just don't let me see it but anyway, I'm just kidding. But, uh, no I, we're talking about dancing and movies and 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 all of a sudden man whoof overnight the forest Hills baptist church built some impregnable massive beautiful walls here, here was the problem my sister at 14 had nothing in her altar she had big walls no altar. And so somewhere we missed something. Let me, let me, just bear with me. We missed something. And all of a sudden, we stopped this, this side of the auditorium, this, 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 this wall building side. We stopped talking about our altars. We stopped talking about our worship. We start talking about our prayer. We stopped talking about our intensity. We, start talk, we, we just stopped talking about uh, all of the emotion of Jesus Christ. We stopped talking about God speaking to us. We got afraid of the Holy Spirit. We let the charismatics uh, scare us away from the terms Holy Ghost and Holy Spirit and different things. And so the, 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 the idea became, uh, man, we got to build bigger walls. And it's funny, Regina, the culture's getting worse. The walls got to get taller. And so, so all of a sudden you go to a conference hosted by, <laughs> never mind, you go to a conference you thought I was going there, didn't you, brother? And uh, uh, you go to a conference in Illinois, and you go to a conference, and, uh, and the conference would be on build a bigger wall. Build a bigger wall. And, and bless God, if you uh, don't have good walls, you're not a good Christian. And, and here's, here, now again, it was a knee-jerk reaction to the liberalism of the 60s. Free love. Peace, smoke it up, dope it up, drink it up, have a big time. And so we said, oh, man, the culture is going downhill. Build some walls. And so, so we built walls. So from the 70s and 80s, many of us grew up in Big Wall Baptist Church or Big Wall Community Church or whatever Big Wall Church you went to, but you went to Big Wall Church. 1990, something happened. Guys came along and said, man, those walls are so high, lost people can't get in the walls. We're not reaching the culture. And so in the 90s, a knee-jerk... Are y'all getting hot? So in the 90s, so in the 90s, some guys came along. In the 90s... So, In the 90s, some guys came along, and by the way, they weren't evil, they weren't wicked, they they weren't anti-God, but they said, we don't have anything on our altars. 
We're just formal and dead in our worship and our religion. And, and, and so they said, hey, we got to tear down the walls. And they, 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 they moved all the way over here. And they said, man, let's just get our temples right. And you know what happened? It's kind of like a seesaw. Oh, that's right. We, and we got our worship back. We, we threw out those old dead 21-page uh, songbooks. And, and we got rid of all that formal worship. And, and people began to not be afraid anymore to say amen and hallelujah. And raise your hands and worship. And all of a sudden, we pendulumed to where we, we went in the 90s and the 2000s. And we said, man, it's all about our altar. It's just worship God. It's just love God. It's just worship God. Worship God. Love God. Praise and worship. Love God. Praise and worship. No walls, just temple. And man, we, we just went all the way. And so then all these movements came and these great churches came. And you guys that have walls, you're outdated and you're, you're pharisaical and you're this and that. We don't have any walls. Man, we just love Jesus and it's awesome over here. We love Jesus. It's great. But then... We watched something happen now. They didn't have any walls. And man without any walls leads us to, and, and don't miss this, the Rob Bells of the world that begin to say, hey man, it's not just this, it's this and it's this and, yeah. and, 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 and no walls. And so we didn't stop at just our altars. Now we're into the, the whole coexistent movement and we're into the whole everything's okay as long as you're sincere kind of like that little church I told you about they said we preach Christ crucified and then it's just we preach Christ and now it's just we preach and so here you've got all temple no walls and over here you've got all wall no temple now I would submit that the God's plan is build the temple first then build some walls to protect the temple. But don't ever let the walls become greater than the temple. So let's go back to the 70s. How high is your wall? My, high, <laughs> my wall is seven feet, liberal. My wall is seven and a half feet. What's the line on your girls? My girls, their dresses do not come down. I mean, it's past the knee. Liberal, my girls, you can't see their ankles. How many did you have on your buses? All these wall questions. I'm, I'm going to get somewhere. Just hold on. So we, we said we've got to have bigger walls. So the, the necklines went higher. Hemlines went lower. The boys all started wearing white shirts. If you wear a pink shirt, blue shirt, lavender shirt, any other shirt, black shirt, liberal. If you wore cowboy boots, compromiser. Because Jesus wore brogans. Amen. I mean, just we began to build walls on top of walls. Wait a minute. Now we pendulum shift back over to our temple. Oh, it doesn't matter what you wear. And all of a sudden, the dresses got higher. And the necklines got lower. And, and the, got tighter. And, and all of a sudden, by the way, the praise teams came out. And you never saw a fat, ugly woman on a praise team. It's always the pretty, skinny girls and low... I'm just, I'm just, y'all don't like that. I don't care. I really have come to the place, I just don't care. Because some of you need to listen. We swung all the way back over here where everything's all right, everything's good. God says, What should be in your temple? Number one, if you're taking notes, holiness unto the Lord. Should be in your temple. The only attribute of our God that is a thrice mentioned attribute is holiness. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty. That's the temple. So if I'm if I'm Mr. Joe Christian in 2013, Lord, I want to have a I want to have a red hot a flaming temple. God, I want to pursue. Holiness. Boy, I come to an altar and I give my heart to Christ. And I say, God, I want to pursue holiness. I want to know the power of God. I don't want to talk about revival into 100 years ago. I want to have revival right now. God, give me holiness. 
And God the Spirit says, you want holiness? I'll pour my Spirit on whoever is thirsty. And we'll pursue holiness. So, man, I want to be like God. Now, what's the opposite of holiness? Unholiness. So my altar is screaming for holiness. God, I want to be, I want to know you. But man, I get bombarded with everything that's unholy. How do you protect an altar of holiness? You build a wall against that which is unholy. And so you say, you know what? There's probably some movies that are that are profane and sexual. And listen, independent Baptist, ultraviolent. Hey, hey, ultraviolent. Don't don't tell me that we can't watch a hundred murders an hour and that not affect our thought process. I, I asked the men at the conference. I've never watched it, but I just happened to pass by. And I thought, who would put this on television? And it was a movie about just not killing people. It was about torturing and killing people. The whole movie about torturing. I'm thinking, who would ever want to sit for two hours and watch somebody torture and kill? That's, that's, that's demonic. So, so I have a wall that says, hey, I'm not going to let wickedness influence my thinking now here's what happened our temple only got to say oh no you don't need any walls but if you don't have any walls all of a sudden the influence that you allow into your life begins to affect and what's on your altar gets dis- uh, uh, gets defiled and all of a sudden you're not thinking holiness now you're being defiled because you had a red hot altar with no walls and then some of you are going Bless God, we do not watch movies. I have a friend who goes to a church that preaches strictly against a television. You are not to have a television at all. But if you have a television in your home and you put a sign on it for homeschool only and you rent a DVD, it's okay. Because you're not watching television, you're watching a DVD. We do not have television in our home. We do not listen to bad rap music. By the way, moms and dads, a wall that you really need to reestablish in your home is the music played on your children's iPods. And I know this is old preaching, but listen, it's a good wall. Because you can't listen to filth about sex and violence and cultural division and all kind of other garbage and keep the altar holy unto the Lord. By the way, what happens when you defile the altar? You die. What happens when you put unholy fire on the altar? You die. Die. Dead. Gone. So, so we, don't have, uh, we don't have music, and uh, uh, we don't have movies, and uh, my wife wears dresses now. And, and look at our walls. Walls don't make you holy. It's the altar that makes the holy. It's the walls that protect the altar of holiness. And some of you, 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 you haven't figured that out. That you're not spiritual because you build walls. We're spiritual when we have a desire for holiness as a byproduct of our holiness. We build walls to protect the holiness, but the walls aren't what we're impressed with. It's the holiness unto the Lord that we're impressed with. They were saying, what, what's your, what's your, I, I just don't want to displease the Lord, so I'm going to be very careful. Well, Brother Stan, so you sound like one of those legalists. Legalism is just so that you're not ignorant. And don't make that statement in public to show your ignorance. Legalism is adding works to salvation. It's the oldest recorded book we have in the Bible. Who's the oldest recorded? What is the oldest recorded book we have in the Bible? Book of Job. Long before there was religion, there was Job. By the way, Job was one of the most spiritual men the Bible gives us record of. Job said, I... I'm I'm going to worship God, and he offered sacrifice. Then Job said, it may be, I don't even know for sure, but it may be that my kids 
aren't where they ought to be. So I'm going to offer on their behalf just in case. I'm going to offer just in case on their behalf. And when God on his throne was approached by Satan, the accuser, and Satan said, uh, you know, let me talk to you about those people on earth. God said, have you considered my servant Job? When God looked at his trophies of grace, he said, Job is the best one I've got. Long before there was church, long before there was religion, there was God, Satan, and Job. And Job said, I'll not look upon a maid. I'll not look upon a maid. I'll set no wicked thing before mine eye. That's just holiness 101. Job said, if I look on a maid, I might lust. And if I might lust, I might lose my Holiness, I'll not set anything wicked before mine eye. See, what we did in the 70s was we built all wall and no altar. In the 90s, 2000s, we built all temple, no walls. And let me just tell you, both are wrong, wrong, wrong. Emily and Madeline, I, I don't know that they don't spend 20, 20 hours out of every day together. My little girls. These are my little girls there. And, and then Laura and Sarah and Damaris and Phoebe and just all of the little girls, all our teenagers and young ladies. In, in their heart, there ought to be an altar, Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, where they present themselves a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable the Lord. Now to have on their altar an altar of purity. God, I want to be pure before you. And our young men ought to have that same altar of purity. By the way, I, I long for the day and I thank God for the day when I get to conduct weddings and be around young people that have not bought into the lie that everybody's doing it. Not everybody's doing it. And so we, we as a church preach things like holiness and purity and femininity and, and advertise your uh, femininity, not your sexuality. And you say, well, Brother Sansel, you're just trying to tell us how that we should do. No, I, I, I'm really not. Uh, by the way, if you want to know about a pastor that tells you how to do certain things, you talk to some of them guys, they'll tell you how some pastors are. I'm not like that. I'm just throwing it out there. You catch what I'm throwing. If not, leave it alone. And so, so we say, let's get a mindset of femininity and purity and, ma- hey, masculinity we're we're um our men just cutting them right off just making a bunch of mamby pamby little nothing sissy boys and so we say look by the way if if they had some daddies just throw that out there if they had some mamas so so we say look what's on your altar if you don't have anything for the Lord, there's nothing, there's nothing on, there's not a wall in the world that will keep somebody that has no altar. My sister will tell you that when Curtis Hudson told John Stansel to get rid of them blue jeans, in her heart, there rose up such an anger that, buddy, she going to put on them blue jeans. And bless God, she did put on, and she put on a lot less than them blue jeans, and I believe she took off a lot more than she should have. Because there was nothing in her heart. Nothing. And so we say, look, I want you to love God with all your heart. By the way, it's interesting. When people love God, there's no commandment grievous for them. When you do, there's no, God, if you want me, now listen, Brother Malpas, I don't want to go to Alaska. God knows my heart. But if God called me to go and made it, I mean, he'd have to make it real clear. Frogs, locusts, lice, <laughs> snakes, I mean, the whole thing. I'd go. I'd visit Valerie every few weeks when I come back here, but I'd go. But when God calls, you go. You do when God teaches. So I, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm saying, 
had a piano player in Texas, and she played the piano for me. And, uh, and she was the only lady in our church that didn't wear pants. Only lady when we went there, and probably the only lady when we left. One of us, family. And I said, Anna, why don't you wear pants? She said, because God touched my heart about it one day. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, the pastor came in before you and said, uh, women don't wear pants. And, uh, and uh, she said, uh, that, that, that really struck me, and I began to study it. And she said, God just dealt with my heart uh, that, that I was not going to do that anymore. I wasn't going to wear pants. She, she was a middle-aged woman at the time. And uh, I said, really? I said, well, when he left, why did you continue not to wear pants? She said, Brother Sam, so you didn't hear me. Pastor didn't tell me not to wear pants. She said, God told me not to wear pants. Now, that church, as soon as that other pastor left, by the way, he left in shame and disgrace, in adultery and embezzlement. You know why? Because he had big walls and no altar. She said, doesn't matter what the pastor says. It's God. See, we've forgotten that holiness and purity and all these other biblical traits are the key. And we're, we're to please a holy God with our life. By the way, it's still our reasonable service. So I've got my friends that say, Brother Stansel, you know, why don't you, why don't you not, why don't you not do some things? You can get away with some things. Brother Stansel, why don't you not do something? And I say, well, you know, I don't mind what you do. You do anything you want to do. And, 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 and it doesn't bother me at all what they do. But I know me. I, I know me. And, and, and if, I, if I moved away from any walls at all, just at all heart, I know, I know where I would go. And, and, and I'm pretty sure that we're all like that to some degree. And so I say to them, guys, you do whatever you want to do, but, but I need to protect some things that God's put on my heart. And so there's just some things that I don't do. Now, I could go to the bathroom and change clothes, put on a pair of flip-flops and a T-shirt and shorts, and I could, I could preach the paint off the walls. And bless God, it'd be the same Bible, same preaching, same everything. And I, I have a pair of shorts and flip-flops and T-shirt in that bathroom, and I was going to go change. But, you know, to be honest with you, and I'm not being funny about this, I already feel a little bit weird just down this far. Now, listen, you, don't have, you can wear anything you want to wear. I'm still going to, I mean, but for me, this is the house of God. Now, I'm, you know, go to the bathroom, bring that stuff here. Please. Kindness. Now, Brother Keith, I felt perfectly comfortable last Friday in blue jeans and a T-shirt. We were under a tent. And, and I, I told Keith, I said, man, these guys are wearing suits and ties. It's 95 degrees. We're under a tent. I said, you know what, Brother Keith? These guys are oversaved. I felt perfectly, I didn't feel one bit embarrassed, out of place. By the way, God spoke to my heart. God dealt with me. But, but that was the place. Thank you very much. Now, there's a place. These are my, by the way, if you want a pair of comfortable shoes, these are Croc flip-flops. These are wonderful. These are, these are, these are, uh, it's a big ones. I know, don't make any comment. But these are my St. John's Bay really cute shorts. And this is one of my two favorite shirts in the world. This is my bacon shirt. Mmm, <laughs> bacon. Now, I could, I could take my, my bacon shirt and put it on and take my, and go in to, the, to the back room and be, be modest because I said, whatever you do, don't scare them. And... Uh, but I could put my bacon shirt on and put my flip-flops on, and, and I would still be Brent, the pastor. <laughs> bacon. Bacon is the only food that makes every other food around it better. 
If you got bad food, put bacon on it. It's an hors d'oeuvre after that. Amen. And I could put on my shorts. And I put on my flip-flops. And I could say, man, I got temple like you wouldn't believe. Oh, God spoke to my heart. But I also know this. When I'm in these type of clothes, I'm not in a business mindset. I'm just not in a... This is playtime. This is golf time. This is beach time. This is watch TV time. I, 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 I'm very careful to say this, and, and don't, don't miss this, but the fellow that really was one of the ones that just made this, and, and please don't miss it. You're gonna, some of you will take this wrong, and, and I don't want to be taken wrong. The fellow that made this attitude of casual Christianity, all temple, no walls, no shirt, no tie. I mean, just light shirt, light tie. I mean, no tie, shirt. You know, I've seen him two or three times when he went to meet the president or bury, bury a family member. And I thought, isn't that interesting that, that God, the work of God, the ministry of God, gets beach attire and to meet the president gets business attire? I just think that's a little bit different. And by the way, I don't, I don't hate that guy. He buried his son in a suit and tie. Thought that was interesting. He buried his son in a suit and tie. Thought that was just a little bit interesting. See, here's the deal, folks. I can tell you, moms, dads, here's what you ought to do. But what I can't do for you is put anything on your altar. If, if, I, if I can't, listen, now I got four kids and I'm scared of death just like the rest of you moms and dads. If God doesn't put something on Quinn, Colin, Madeline, and Grant's altar, Valerie and I can build the biggest walls in town and it won't matter. You understand that the thing that I'm most concerned about, and listen to me very closely, is that you get the wall, but you never get the altar. So, Brother Stansel, we got pretty walls. Pharisees had better walls than you did, and Christ said they were snakes, vipers, dead men. Fundamentalism built some beautiful, beautiful walls, and then we go to Facebook. And we find out that everybody we went to school with in our fundamental schools is living like the devil and in homosexual relationships and singing in the bars and nightclubs. And you think, what happened? They learned about walls, but they never put anything on their altar. Now, let me make one statement. Please listen to me. You don't have to have anything like I have on my walls. And I, if your walls are better than mine, you stay with your walls. And I don't have, I'm, I'm not a big wall builder. I think that some walls, be careful, you know. But if God touches your husband about his altar, and then because he's touched your husband about his altar, your husband tries to build a wall, would you please not defile his altar by tearing down his wall? And if your, your wife says to your husband, honey, God's touched my heart about some things, and and I think we ought to, to build some walls to protect this thing God's done on my altar. Would you not defile your wife's altar by tearing down her walls? And, and when your kids come back from youth camp or junior camp and, and they say, man, God has done something. And daddy, I want to go to Sunday school and I want to go to church. And, and, and listen, by the way, watch it. And you're, you're going to miss this. Do you know that, listen, I want you to get this because this is different than the way I was preached when I was a kid. Church is a wall, not an altar. Sunday school is a wall, not an altar. Wednesday night is a wall, not an altar. That's what some of you got. When I come to church, I've got a big altar. No. Sunday school, church, that's your wall. To protect what's on your altar. You can have a string of Sunday school pins down to the floor and be as carnal as the liquor store owner. Because that's a wall. And what good does it do to come to church Sunday morning and Sunday night and Wednesday night and God never touch your heart about anything?
reading your Bible. Now, be careful, you'll miss this. Reading your Bible is a wall, not an altar. I have read through the Bible. I, I love you guys, and I do it too. I just finished day 79 on U version. Bible reading. I do that. I read U version. I'm on day whatever it is too. I've read my Bible. Hey, reading your Bible is not an altar, that's a wall. Now, as you read the Word of God, the God of the Word is revealed to you, and He begins to work in your life. But just because you read your Bible doesn't mean you have a big altar. It is what God does to you when you read the Bible that's on your altar. That's why it's a living word piercing even to the dividing of center of soul and spirit joined in marriage. It is a discerner of the thought and intent of the heart. Hey, reading the Bible, that's a wall. What God does in your heart while you read the Bible, that's the temple. Coming to church, reading your Bible, tithing is a temple. No, it's a <laughs> tithing, giving, worshiping in your giving. That's a wall. We're going to look at this next week, 2 Corinthians 8. That's where we're going to finish the sermon. They first gave of their own selves. God doesn't really necessarily want your money if he doesn't have your heart. But by the way, when he has your heart, he'll have everything else you got. Soul winning. Be careful, Brother Rick's tightened up by there. Soul winning. It's a wall. Oh, Brother Sam, so I go soul winning every Tuesday night. Good. The Bible says that we're to let our light shine before men. Then they may say good works and glorify our fathers in heaven. We're to be a witness to the resurrection. Soul winning is not a time and a place on a Tuesday night, a Thursday night, a Friday night, a Wednesday afternoon. It is not a time and a place. But listen, we set a time and a place so that we guard the altar. The altar is, man, I've got to let men and women know about Christ. So I'm going to go at a regular time of the week so that my wall can protect my temple. And my temple is that I'm commanded to be a witness unto the uttermost parts of the earth. I go soul winning, I read my Bible, I tithe, I come to church. Look at my walls. And, man, I thought about it. Hit the pig. I read my Bible, I tithe, I go to church, I go soul winning. And look at my walls. And that's why the church is dead. It's because we've built walls with no temple. And you say, Brother Stansel, let's tear down all the walls and let's just build a temple. And when you build a temple with no walls, liberalism and all the other isms come in because the devil is subtle and he takes the fire that you have for Christ and he diverts it into some other good thing, just not the best thing. And you wonder why the church is dead and the culture is shot. It's because one of two reasons. We either have all temple, no walls, or we have all walls and no temple. To be successful, you have to be separate from the world for the right reason, which is your heart to God the altar, the wholeness, the passion for purity, the desire to please God, the Christ-like spirit. You say, Brother Stansel, look at my walls. No, look at the God that I serve. My walls are to protect me and God, not looking at my walls. Fundamentalism is dead as a movement. Now, we're not dead, and we're fundamentalists. But fundamentalism is dead because of this very thing. We built walls with no altar. But now I wouldn't give you a lick for this emergent church garbage that's all temple and no walls because there's no end to the progression. Once you start down the road of cultural satisfaction, the Bible makes it very clear. She, tried, she quoted Ecclesiastes. Sin is never satisfied. So trying to appease the culture with the culture is a never-ending phenomenon of slippery slope sliding. Yeah. Brother Sansel, we don't have to. No, we don't. I promise you, I'm the same guy in a pig shirt or not. I'm the same guy 
in croc flip-flops or not. But you come next week, and I'll be in the pastoral suit and tie, and I'll preach from the same Bible. We'll preach the same gospel, the same message. You say, Brother Samson, we got to get with the culture. No, the culture's got to get with Christ. And so I want, with all my heart, and this is, this, listen, how many have been here for four years? I've been here four years. How many have been here all four years with me? You figured it out yet? I hope you figured it out. There's got to be a biblical approach to your life. And if you haven't figured this out yet, we're, we, I don't know, I've tried to tell you. I want you to worship him with your heart and life. And I want you to be careful not to get caught up in the world, love not the world and the things that are in the world. If the love, the man, any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. That's still in the Bible. You can't take it out, guys. It's in there. Love not the world. The culture of the world is anti-God. So what do we do? We try to biblically approach our lives in ministry. Man, I got to just keep loving God. I got to guard that. I got to love God. And you know what? It gets tiring. It gets, you get wore out. Because you're always trying to guard against the world creeping in over here. And you got to keep that passion. And you got to keep that love for Christ. And you got to keep focusing on Him. And, and, and as soon as you get this flame stirred back up, you got to run over here and, and repitch your wall because there's been some chinks in it. And then you get your wall tightened up and you got to run back over here. And you say, man, I'm just going to quit. And when you quit, the devil comes in, defiles your altar and destroys your temple and lays your land desolate. You know why Nehemiah built the wall in 52 days? People had a mind to work. They got busy. They, they had their swords in one hand, their, their trowels in the other, and they were building and battling. You know what happened to our church? Whew, man, I'm just going to let all these walls go. We're just going to go love Jesus. We're just going to, no more walls, just love. And they got this little group over here, and I preached in some of the churches like that. Bless God, they got walls that would please the Pharisees. It's dead as four o'clock in there. There's no heart for God. There's no worship. There's no praise. There's no man. God has done some things in my life. Let me brag on Jesus a little bit. I'm done. You wonder why your kids hate the religion that you practice? Wonder why your kids don't want any part of church? You talk about your temple, but you build no walls. Or you build all your walls and you have no temple. Your kids are like, man, love Jesus and act like the world. That doesn't make sense. I'm just going to enjoy the world. That's exactly the choice I made when I was 17 years old. I said, man, this Phariseeism is ridiculous. And by the way, I wasn't mad at God. I wasn't mad at my mom. I wasn't mad at my dad. I just said, this religion garbage, say one thing and do another. I'm going to go get party on because this, this, this phony, fake, by the way, it's both fake. All heart, no walls, and all walls, no heart. It's both fake. And your kids say, you don't mean either thing you say. Best thing, just be honest. Say, kids, I don't know where all the lines are, but I'm going to draw one right here. And son, I don't know where we could draw the line, but I think this is safe. And, and son, I don't, and sis, I don't know what real, you know, it's like the old guy said, I don't know what porn uh, isn't, but I know what it is when I see it. Ladies, I don't know what modesty is, but, but I'm going to draw the line here. And, and honey, I don't know if we could go to this movie or go to that movie, but let's be safe, not sorry. And, and I don't know if this is acceptable or not, but I think the principle that I'm getting and the thing I'm getting, here's, and sometimes you just draw some lines and you be honest with your kids and say, man, I don't know where the line really is, but let's be safe, not sorry. And so, you know, if, if I could be a better testimony wearing a tie or not wearing a tie, and God knows I would much rather not wear a tie, but if I can be a better testimony, not wearing or wearing, I'll just be safe rather than sorry. And I'll just choose here. And I'll tell my kids, no, the Bible doesn't say thou shalt wear a tie. But kids, I don't know where I might begin to slide into a lackadaisical spirit, so I'm just going to keep a tie on. Because when I have a tie on, I feel more business-like. I feel like I'm doing business as an ambassador for the king. 
And I don't know what modesty is or isn't. And, and this lady says she can be modest and look like this. And, and I don't agree with that. And this lady says she can be modest and look like that. And I think she looks like a potato sack. By the way, ladies, modesty doesn't mean you have to look like an Amish woman. If you want to look like an Amish woman, more power to you. But my wife's smoking and modest. And the music, I don't know. Man, I like this music and I like that music and I like everywhere, but, but right uh, there. So the Bible doesn't say, I know, so since I'm the daddy, here's what's good. And by the way, not every song on the radio is evil. Not every song on the radio is good either. So you got to be vigilant. Everything on Disney is wrong, by the way. Just kidding. 95% of everything on Disney is wrong. But, but you just say, honey, this is good, this is bad. Now, this is why this is. By the way, you know why we don't have some walls? It takes time to build walls. It takes effort to build walls. And you have to actually parent instead of be buddy, buddy. Friend, friend. You have to say, honey, here's why I let you do this last week. But see, the principle is a little bit different here. So this is why we're not going to do this. But I let you do this. Now, do you see that? You don't see? Well, let's explain again. And honey, if you don't see, I'll, I'll just have to ask you to trust me on this one. I think this one is dangerous and that one wasn't. Here's why you can spend the night at this friend's house. And here's why you can't spend the night at that friend's house. And then I'm going to do that again next week. And the next week. And then they'll be gone. And hopefully by then God will have built something in their temple that they'll start building some of their own walls. And by the way, while they're in my house, I'm responsible to build their walls. Because they, they don't have the tools to build their walls yet. But I'm trying to get their temple built as I try to build their walls. So what's more important, temple or walls? I think you've got to have both. I think you've got to have a balance of, man, I do this because I want God's blessing. I want God to speak to my heart, and I want God to invest in me so I might invest in us. And I don't want ever, ever, by the way, better men, better women, better families, better churches than ours have gone down the drain. Got to, got to have that passion. Oh, Okay, Lord, we got that passion. I'm going to build a little wall. I'm going to have that passion, build a little wall, and I'm going to build a temple and put my wall around the temple because I want God to have access to my heart. Some of you need to, listen, I'm not saying tear down your temple, but I'm saying you ought to stoke the fire on your altar and stop bragging about your stupid temple. I mean, you're stop bragging about your stupid walls. I don't care what you do or what you don't do. If that's what you and God want to do, I'm for that. Don't be mad that I don't do what you do, and I'll not be mad that you don't do what I don't do. Some of you, bless the Lord, I think you have a little bit of something on your altar, but you have nothing to protect your temple. What happened to our churches? Oh, let's love Jesus. Come on, let's all love Jesus. Oh, we love you. Come on in and teach a little bit. Doesn't matter that you're a false prophet. Come on in. We love you. Come on, come on. Doesn't matter that you teach heresy. Oh, there is no God. Don't worry about it. Come on in. Oh, there's no hell. Come on in, man. We're under the big tent of love, Jesus. The end result of walls without tempo, temple is Westboro Baptist Church. They hate everybody. They're perfect independent Baptists. They hate everybody. Nobody can come in their temple. Nobody can come in their walls. But don't tell me one lick those people are saved. Man, that's not Jesus. It's not the God of the Bible. But boy, they got nice walls, don't they? You want to be known like that? I don't. You want to be, the, you want to be, you want to be seen as the people that everything's all right? And everything, that's anti-Bible. Something's wrong. The devil's out there. There's got to be something wrong. There is a real enemy. Don't tear down your wife's wall because God's doing something in her temple. Don't tear down your husband's wall because God's doing something in his temple. Don't tear down, and children, don't tear down your parents' wall. If dad comes in and says, you know, God's touched my heart about something. We're going to make some changes. Trust your dad that God's touching his temple, so let him build some walls around him. It may save his life. It may save your family's marriage. Build some temples. 
build some walls. Build the temple first, but then come along and in 52 days get you up a wall to protect what 17 years took you to build. Now listen, I'll make this statement and be done. You can destroy in one moment's pleasure what took you a lifetime to build. One moment. You let one moment of slippage, one lapse of judgment, a lifetime of service, never, Dr. Flexen made the statement, never has a man lost so much for so little. And I read, his, I read his sentencing the other day, this man he was speaking of, and he said, all of my life, except for a period of a few weeks, I tried to do right. All my life, except for three weeks maybe, and in three weeks' time or whatever time it was, he lost everything. you got to have your temple. Keep it red hot. Pray. Read your Bible, go to church, do all those things so that it can reveal to you God from his word. But don't just have the temple with no walls and don't have the walls with no temple. Father, I pray you'd help us. I pray you'd speak to our hearts. Thank you for the principles found in the word of God. Nehemiah wasn't satisfied until the walls were built and the gates were hung. There was an urgency about him to get the job done because he knew that what was going on in Jerusalem wouldn't last very long if the enemy was able to come in and destroy. And Lord, I pray tonight you'd burn our altars fresh in a new sin fire. I want to think about Elijah. Now we put something on our altar and see you consume it with a holy fire. I think about Abraham standing all night guarding against his altar being destroyed. Lord, may we have our altar of fire. Solomon dedicated the temple and God sacrificed thousands upon thousands. And yet within a few years, the man who led the greatest worship in the history of the world had given himself to idolatry because he had all temple with no walls. He let the women of his eye affect his heart. They turned him to serve other gods. The man that led the greatest worship in the history of the world within a few years had defiled himself with false gods. If that can happen to the smartest, wisest man, it can happen to every man in this room, every woman in this room, every boy in this room, every girl in this room. Help us to keep the temple guarded with the walls. And Lord, I beg you to forgive me for, Lord, uh, my own sin and uh, Lord the uh, the bad example testimony in some of these areas of wall building Lord I pray you'd help our church in Christ's name I just give a very simple invitation let's stand to our feet music is playing if you need to come won't you step out of your place Asking God to build us some temples and then build some walls of protection around them. You step out of your place. If you need to come, you step out of your place. You, come. you have longed for sweet peace and for faith to increase. And have earnestly, fervently prayed. But you cannot have rest or be perfectly blessed until all on the altar is laid. Is your whole on the altar of sacrifice laid? Your heart does the Spirit control? You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you yield him your body and soul. Folks are here, others are coming. 
you need to come, you come. If you need to pray with somebody, talk to somebody, others are here. Make a decision, ask a question. Maybe you need to join a church, present yourself for baptism, whatever your decisions are. Mark sings another verse. This will be your verse. You step out of your place. You come. Would you walk with the Lord in the light of his word and have peace and contentment always? Our altars are what God you does You must our do his sweet will to be free from all ill. Our walls are what we do to protect what God's doing in our hearts. On the altar, your all you must When's the last play. time God touched your heart about anything? Is your all on the altar of sacrifice laid? When's the last time the Holy Spirit your heart touched you does the Spirit specifically control? about an area? You can only be blessed and have peace and sweet rest as you healed him your Rebecca, body play softly. Heads are about eyes are closed. Rebecca, softly plays. Let me ask you this question. When's the last time that you remember God specifically touching your heart? Now, I'm not talking about 70 years ago. I'm not talking about when you were a Sunday school teacher or a bus worker back in the 80s or 90s. When's the last time God said, that person needs you, or this air in your life is out of bounds, or your spirit has gotten sideways. You say, preacher, it's been a long time. You know what you've got? You've got nothing on your altar. There's nothing in your temple. And my brother says, I'm at church. Yeah, you've got big walls. You know, some people worry when people come to the altar. Oh, I wonder what kind of life they're living. They're probably living a pretty good life because they're allowing God to move in their altar, move in their temple. Brian and I were talking years ago. We were just asking the question, I wonder why some people, why some people never seem to have God speak to them. I don't know the answer to that. To me, and I'm just giving you my, I don't know your illustration, I'll give you my illustration. God has to deal with me every day. I mean, every day it's a little left, a little right, keep on going, stop that, start this. It's just, just a constant communication. When's the last time God spoke to you about something? Now, if God hadn't spoken to you in a while, I'm just telling you, something's not right somewhere. And you got, we're not Catholic. You don't come confess to me. You don't confess to a priest. But when is the last time that God's Holy Spirit dealt with you specifically and directly about anything I want to make a public apology heads are about eyes are closed it helps me with your head now I say the word crap a lot and uh, Pam Carver and Kim and some of the others were talking about their kids say crap and then they say well preacher says crap that's terrible I'm the pastor. And I apologize publicly about that. But you know what? God has to constantly be working on my altar and on my walls because that's just my nature. I say a lot of other stuff too and have to ask God to forgive me for that. But you know when Kim told me that day, I didn't get mad at her. It didn't hurt my feelings one bit. Other than, I can't believe that I've let that wall of my language. Now, it's not the language that matters, but why would I let my heart even get to the place where that didn't bother me? When was the last time God spoke to you? Specifically and directly. How many of you, heads are by nobody looking. Everybody put your head down. How many of you have said that God has radically shown me something specific in the last 30 days. Let me see your hand. Now, put your hand down. That's a warning. That's a good number. If it's been more than 30 days, I would suggest you carve you out some alone time with God and say, God, what's wrong with me that you haven't spoken to me directly in 30 days? 
You haven't corrected me, confronted me, challenged me, encouraged me. It's been 30 days since you've really touched my heart with the finger of the Holy Ghost. You get that kind of temple, you'll build bigger walls than I could ever encourage you to build because you want to protect what God's doing. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the sweetness of the Holy Spirit that brings to light the principles of the Word of God to show us, Lord, how to live successfully, influentially in this world, preparing for the world to come by becoming more and more conformed to the image of Christ. We pray it that you'd bless. We pray it that you would move. May we be very sensitive to the Holy Spirit of our God, that even the mention of the Word of God would bring uh, us to attention and to conviction and to correction in our lives. Help our daddies and our mamas and our young people, Lord, to have a heart for God so we would live for you, be pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. You may be seated. Uh, one thing I mentioned, I failed to, you may be seated. One of the things I failed to mention, family devotions. That's a wall, not a temple. But you have family devotions to help your children to develop the temple. That goes along with the church and prayer and all those other things, all right? Uh, offering tonight, let's be faithful. I love the new members class. People were asking me about giving and tithing and all these things. And, you know, in the Greek, uh, you've been told that 10% is the number. But we've just studied more in this new temple-only world that God says 50% is. I'm just kidding. Just kidding. But we do practice grace giving. And as the Lord's been so good to us, we give back to him in worship. Uh, remember now, as the summer comes, bills stay the same. Ministry actually expands. And usually giving decreases because of the summer months. So be faithful in your giving that we we want to just be faithful this, this summer in all our ministries and activities and asking the Lord to bless that, all right? So God bless you as you give. Thank you, Rebecca. I'm sitting over here, and, and I looked down at Madeline, and I winked at her uh, during the offertory, and, and Trent just smiled at me. <laughs> I said, Trent, I'm winking at my daughter. He said, Shoo. thank God, preacher. Amen. Uh, ladies, if you can help us uh, with the following items for our mother, daughter, friends banquet, uh, round or long, medium-sized woven baskets, mosquito netting, tiki torches, Coconuts, live palm fronds, jungle-looking artifacts, palms in containers. See Nancy Davis or Stephanie Anderson or bring them by the church office. We need these by April 30th. Obviously, these are for decorations for our theme of it's a jungle out there. And uh, ladies, sign up for that. Bring your friends, bring your family. My wife will be speaking. And we're going to have a great, great time. Looking forward to that. Tickets are $15 for adults, $10 for young people. And Miss Sheila <coughs> will be in the back. 
quickly in the West Wing, we're going to go straight to a Sunday school teacher's meeting. Uh, all workers and teachers, <coughs> if you'll meet them in the West Wing. Appreciate Brother Courtright and uh, um, uh, Kim and Dwayne and everybody that uh, did a great job today with the new members. Luncheon had 80, 80 people. Now, of course, that's our staff and deacons at first, but then a good group of 35, 40 people uh, for the new members. So we rejoice over that. Uh, Spirit Day is uh, tomorrow, the 22nd, at Tyrone Chick-fil-A. Brother Jim is such a gracious host and does a great job. Um, and then tomorrow, or Tuesday night, I keep saying tomorrow, but Tuesday night, uh, Regina will be here. And uh, faith, fam- uh, faith and Freedom uh, meeting. And, and just listen, some of you need to be here because we need to impact this community. And so let's talk to Regina after church tonight. Senior Saints are going to Mosey on, uh, let's see, this is uh, the 23rd, Tuesday, $20 for lunch and Mosey and the IMAX. So you can't beat that. And uh, we'll take the motor coach over, have a big time looking forward to that. Bridal shower for Caleb and for Nicole is uh, the 26th, registered at Target. Singles are going to the Cheesecake Factory and the International Mall on the 27th. And the mentoring group, if you're in the local high school, Boca Siega High. By the way, in our new members luncheon, we found two or three Boca Siega graduates. So uh, kind of neat. Uh, 9-15 to 10-15, May the 2nd and the 16th. And if you would like to have your child dedicated, he's, he or she has not been dedicated to the Lord yet. Uh, we'll be glad to do that. Just let us know in the office. Brother Malpas will be in the back. And uh, Caleb, I want you to make sure to talk to him. And then uh, my, Matthew, I want you to make sure to talk to him. If you're interested in missionary aviation, see him. Uh, if you just love missions, talk to Brother Malpas. And we're so glad that they're uh, being a part of our church family. And uh, you better thank God that they're up there or God might call you to go with them. Amen. And uh, I'm telling you, my wife loves the warm weather, but she likes that Yukon show and uh, I think it's just because it just so amazes her that people would live where it's 40 below zero on purpose. One guy from Boston moved up there 40 years ago, and he's this Boston guy hunting moose in the middle of the outback, I mean, or the uh, tundra out there. So uh, anyway, let's stand together and appreciate Rebecca. And boy, didn't Isaac do a good job today? What a blessing. And uh, Miss Moore, our music. And if you've got musical uh, ability, see uh, Brother uh, Mark over here, Miss Rebecca. I love you. Come see Regina. Go see Brother Malpas. God bless you. I'll see you Wednesday night, 7 o'clock. You're dismissed.